uh, if you would be so kind to uh, open up your Bibles to the Gospel according to John chapter 14. And we are continuing in our series, God's Unchanging Promises. God's Unchanging Promises. And we will be reading this morning from John chapter 14, verse 27. The scripture declares, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And this morning, I want to talk about God's unchanging promise, the promise of peace. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your goodness and for your mercies, O Lord God. Thank you that you give us this Privilege to come together in your house, O Lord God, to worship, O Lord God, and to receive. Father, we pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word, O Lord God, that you would open our minds and our hearts, that we would truly hear what you want to tell your church. In Jesus' name, amen. So we gather together on Sunday mornings for corporate worship. That means we come together in a large group in adoration of God. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we adore through the singing of songs and receiving encouragement and exhortation from the pastor or the guest speaker of the morning. And as we enter the church, we encounter a network of greeters and ushers who are intentional about making us feel welcome and comfortable. The greeters hold signs that say you belong here and they cheerfully say good morning while the ushers scan the sanctuary for available seats to accommodate our ever-growing attendance. We get settled into our seats as the service countdown is displayed on the screens. And when that countdown reaches zero, we have an expectation that our time of celebration through song is about to begin. One of our amazing worship leaders greets the congregation and lively music quickly begins in the background. We clap our hands and begin to sing. Some of us begin to dance badly. The intent is for us to be in one accord like they were in the book of Acts just before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. The worship team leads us from celebration to adoration as we contemplate the awesome love of Almighty God. And on a day like today, we observe communion or the Lord's Supper as a commemoration of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross at Calvary. And then we sing some more. There's prayer that usually follows with a greeting from one of the pastoral staff. We turn to the video announcements. And we encourage an offering of gratitude before the pastor takes the podium, which, by the way, is not made for people my height. Uh, I cringe every time I see myself on video. I can barely make out my forehead, you know. And we receive a word, and I can tell you that Pastor Steve, our lead pastor, sets the example for the rest of us on diligence and preparation for excellence and presentation of an inspired word from the Lord. We laugh, we cry, we respond to the message. Another Sunday, another inspiring service. So why then is it that so many times, so many of us leave this sanctuary with the same burdens we brought in with us? Why is it that a Christian, a person who loves and serves the Lord, so often walks around with a deficit of peace? We gather together and we sing songs like, It is well. But inside, inside we really feel like it is not. You know, uh, my family, we've gone through, uh, through a season the last couple of years, a challenging season. Many of you, or most of you know. Uh, but actually, a couple of years ago, when this was just getting started, I went up to 
uh, upstate to visit a good friend of mine. Uh, my best friend, as a matter of fact, he's my accountability partner, and every single one of us should have an accountability partner. And as I was relaying to my best friend, my closest friend, uh, the things that were going on in my life and in my heart, we started talking about that song, It, it, it Is Well. We started to contemplate, and he started to question, well, is it really well? In other words, do you have peace? Is it really well? And it made me think, it really, really made me contemplate, is it really well? Shortly thereafter, one day, my wife says, I think I need to go to the emergency room. And I heard, heard the Lord speak to me in my mind and in my heart in the voice of my friend and ask me, is it really well? And I said, it is well. And we got in the car, we started to drive and navigate through traffic on our way to Manhattan, getting cut off by yellow cabs and Ubers. And those of you who know me know just how much I hate driving into Manhattan and As I was driving along, I heard the voice of the Lord asking, is it really well? And I said, it is well. We got to the hospital and went to the emergency room and waited hours. And when I say hours, I mean like 24 to get some information. And I heard the voice of the Lord ask, is it really well? And I said, it is well. And then they gave us news that we didn't really want to hear and said that my wife would need to be admitted. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, is it really well? And I said, it is well. And then shortly thereafter, my wife said, honey, my parents are coming to visit because they want to see how I'm doing. (laughs) And I heard the voice of the Lord (laughs) ask, is it really well? And I said, well. (laughs) But Jesus has promised us peace. Says in the verse that we just read, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus offers us peace, and we don't have to wait until we get to heaven to get it. Jesus said, peace I leave to you. But not only that, Jesus clarifies, this isn't the world's peace. This isn't just any peace. This is my peace. My peace. Now, if you do a general Google search on quotes about peace, you're going to find hundreds, actually thousands of quotes about inner peace, which are all about the individual person. They're all about you. They say things like, peace only comes from accepting the inevitable and taming our desires. Or, promise yourself to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind. So according to man, peace is up to you. Peace is up to me. Peace is up to me. What? I'm supposed to decide my peace. I can't even decide if I want my value meter to be medium or large. I can't even decide if, they, you know, they ask me, do you want two apple pies for $1.50? It's too much pressure. I can't decide that. I'm supposed to decide my peace? No, honestly, it was easier when it was two pies for a dollar. They raised the price. That's on them. The truth is that we are, that we find ourselves faced with decisions and choices options and opportunities all the time and these things fill our minds and confuse our hearts so that peace true peace seems to be ever elusive because of the innumerable conflicts that arise on a daily basis to say nothing about the out of left field real crises that life sometimes presents But Jesus declares, I've given you peace. Actually, he doesn't say that he has given us peace. He says, I give you peace. It is present tense. 
It is an ongoing action. It is peace for the here and now. I give you peace. So when you have marital problems, Jesus says, I give you peace. And when you have financial problems, Jesus says, I give you peace. And when you're going through heartache, I give you peace. And when you're going through heartbreak, I give you peace. And when you're going through sickness, I give you peace. And when you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I give you peace. I give you my peace. Because peace, real peace, real peace is not the absence of conflict that people would lead you to believe. Because you could be at work and not be arguing with your coworker, but not feel peace. You could be at home and not arguing with your spouse and not experience peace. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Don't look at your wife right now. Just because you have the absence of conflict does not mean that you are experiencing real peace. No, beloved, real peace is not absence of conflict. Real peace is the presence of God. Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And I'm here to declare to you that your Savior, your Redeemer, your Deliverer gives you peace. You know, Isaiah chapter 53 declares, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. So you and I, we can freely receive the promise of peace because Jesus already paid for it. Even though I feel like I deserve to live in torment because of my transgressions. I feel like I deserve to live in torment because of my iniquities. I feel like I deserve to live in torment because of my many failures. I feel like I deserve to live in torment because of my sin. Jesus paid the price. For my peace. Jesus said, my peace I give you. My peace I give you. It's not what the world gives. I give you something different. I give you my peace. Now pay attention to this. Jesus then warns about two conditions which rob the heart of peace. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. And don't let your heart be afraid. Troubled and afraid. Now the word troubled in the Greek is tarasso, which means to be stirred or agitated, which is very distinct from the word afraid, which in Greek is delieo, which means to be timid or fearful. So how many of you know that you can be agitated and not be afraid? So according to Jesus, these are two conditions of the heart which can interfere with the believer's ability to experience and enjoy the promise of the peace of God. Two heart conditions, troubled and afraid. You know, I find that interesting. Now, I'll admit that I'm not the sharpest tool in the, in the shed, but you know, when I think of a heart condition that affects my peace, I can definitely see the correlation of being afraid. But I got to tell you, I, I don't necessarily, initially, I didn't see the correlation of being troubled as interfering with my peace. Because I know that the Bible says in John 16 that Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. So if Jesus says that I can expect to have trouble in the world, then I'm not surprised when I encounter trouble. And when I do, I am ready for it. I am ready. If trouble comes, I'm ready for it, you know? That's all I got. That's it. (laughs) But this is how I handle it. Typically. I put every bit of my experience and my strength and my intellect behind my efforts to resolve whatever is the issue to my satisfaction. So there I am with ideas and options and opinions swirling around in 
my head and causing trouble in my heart. And I willingly surrender my peace in exchange for the relentless stirring that robs me. It robs me of my appetite or my rest or my willpower or my better judgment. I spend hours, if not days, playing out arguments in my mind, allowing bitterness and resentment to stir up my heart for a conflict that may not even really exist. I forfeit peace, surrender it. I trade it in in exchange for the opportunity to do things my way. Now, although Frank Sinatra sounded good when he sang about doing things his way, Isaiah declares the Lord speaking to us, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. God's ways are higher. They're better than my ways. My best day can never compare with God's worst day if there is such a thing. My way is the wrong way. My way leads to trouble. But God comes into my life. God loves me as I am, even though I'm set in my ways. He pays the price for my peace. And he gives me his Holy Spirit so that I can get beyond the limitations of my way to reach the unchanging promises of his way. Somebody say amen. Amen. So you might ask, Pastor, if God's way is higher than my way, why does he give me a world, or why does he put me in a world where I will have trouble? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Because the truth is that the origin of my troubles is really a misunderstanding or a misapplication of that scripture. Because Jesus never said that I had to resolve all of those troubles. And Jesus never said that you have to resolve all of those troubles. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You see, there are things that we go through because we need to go through them in order to reach the promise that is God's will. Not all trials are problems to be solved. Some are afflictions to be endured that we might receive that which was promised. Let me say that again. Not all trials are problems to be solved. Some are afflictions to be endured that we might receive that which was promised. You see, Jesus didn't say, if you go to church enough. Jesus didn't say, if you give enough. Jesus didn't say, if you study enough. Jesus didn't say, if you work hard enough, you'll overcome the world. No, When it comes to troubles, Jesus said, do one thing, take heart. Do one thing. When it comes to troubles, do one thing, take heart. The old King James Version says, be of good cheer. Some of you are familiar with that. Be of good cheer. I like that. Be of good cheer. But, you know, when I think of the word cheer, I think of cheerleaders. Now, don't misunderstand me. Uh, Let me give you some context. My son, David, is about to graduate from Hofstra University. Uh, Dean's list every semester. He's about to graduate with a degree as a board-certified athletic trainer. And as part of his clinical rotations, he has served the Hofstra basketball team, which just clinched another title. Uh, And so he served them at some of their games. And... Uh, I got the opportunity to attend a game uh, as a very proud papa. And at these games, the cheerleaders 
are supposed to lead the crowd in cheering for the home team. Although I'm not really sure how all of that works out with all of the flipping and acrobatics. Truth is that cheerleading has become a, a competitive sport all, all on its own. So when God says be of good cheer, does God expect us to be like cheerleaders when we have trouble? Does God expect us to be flipping and dancing and building pyramids? Not at all. You see, when Jesus said be of good cheer, when he said take heart, that word in the Greek is tharseo, which it turns out has nothing to do with pom-poms. It means to have courage. Jesus is saying, have courage. In this world, you will have troubles, but have courage. Why can we have courage? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. We can have courage because Jesus follows that statement up with this life-changing information. Jesus declares, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But be courageous, be brave, be bold. Because when the devil picked a fight with you, he picked a fight with me. You need to understand that when the devil tried to look down on you, he found himself looking up at Jesus. And the bully is suddenly overcome with the truth that shall endure forevermore, which is greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. I don't think you heard me right. I said greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And he has promised us peace. Take heart. But you know what I notice is that before Jesus says, take heart, before he says, in this world you have troubles, he says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And Jesus tells us, he says that there are two heart conditions that threaten our peace. Being troubled and being afraid. And so we see that being troubled causes you to move down the wrong path, the path of self-sufficiency. But being afraid, being afraid causes you to stop moving altogether. Or even worse, to start moving backwards. You see, fear is a trap. Fear is a trap. What kind of trap? I'm glad you asked. Proverbs 29 Verse 25 declares, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear is a snare. Now, some of you may be wondering what a snare is. I know that when I read that, I was. I was wondering what a snare is, and I was wondering why would the writer of Proverbs, King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, compare fear with a snare? And so I figured that if Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, would say that fear is a snare, I should find out what a snare is, and I should find out how fear affects me. So I did some light research, and I found out some really interesting facts about snares. Stay with me. This is very important and very interesting. A snare is basically a noose made by wire or rope that's, a track, that's attached to a stationary object like a tree. So how does a snare work, and how does it compare to fear? Well... When an unsuspecting animal 
is taking an expected path, it can walk headfirst into the noose of a snare. And once it does, if it tries to keep moving forward, the noose tightens. And soon, the animal is strangled. So think about that for a moment. You might be walking through life, minding your own business, when suddenly something happens which allows fear to get a hold of you by the throat. And the more you try to power through, the more you lose your ability to breathe. And as you struggle, fear just holds on tighter and tighter until you can no longer remain conscious. Fear chokes you out like a snare. Fear chokes away your ability to make good choices. And if an animal in a snare tries to go backwards, it actually gets entangled in the rest of the line of that snare. So now that animal is both choked and bound. And the result is that the animal is being strangled while its vital organs are being crushed. The same thing happens to us when we are so overwhelmed with fear to the point where we start to go backwards and wind up bound in our past. Bound in our past. Powerless as the air is sucked out of us. And as we see the enemy plunder our vital resources. You know, the the interesting thing about a snare is that it, it doesn't actually have to catch the animal by the throat. If any part of the animal comes in contact with, with the snare, with that noose, the animal is going to get trapped. As soon as he puts his paw in that move that noose and moves it, it grabs onto his paw. The animal is trapped. And even if it isn't strangled on the spot, That animal is now vulnerable to anything and everything else in the wilderness. Now, fear might not get you by the throat per se, not initially, but it can still leave you crippled and vulnerable to any number of attacks. Fear is a snare. A snare is a simple and cheap trap that can be set up to trap a vast assortment of animals. Just about any animal can be trapped in a snare. Even an animal that's not intended, even a domesticated animal can get trapped in a snare by accident. It happened one time, a dog got trapped in a snare that was meant for a raccoon. And luckily the owner uh, uh, realized what was going on and, and, and freed the dog before the dog was killed, but it was a big deal upstate somewhere. Everybody got, you know, got all up in arms about abuse to animals. You know, the news came out, and they interviewed the dog. They asked the dog, they said, can you tell us about your ordeal? How do you describe your ordeal? And the dog looked at the camera and said, rough. I built the whole sermon about, around that joke. <laughs> but you know, I had, never, I had never thought about fear that way. I had never realized that fear is such a snare. Never realized it, how, the, how it traps you, how it robs you of your vitality. And the thing is this, beloved, listen, the thing about a snare is that it doesn't happen by accident. A snare is placed deliberately in order to entrap. And the same thing applies to fear. Fear is a deliberate measure that the devil uses as a one-size-fits-all tactic to assault our peace. 
It's a one-size-fits-all tactic to assault our peace. Does it matter how big you are, how strong you are, how long you've been in church? Fear is a trap for all of us. And you might be thinking, oh, no, pastor, you're going too far. You can't always blame a little bit of fear on the devil. Well, let me tell you what 2 Timothy 1.7 declares. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So if God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, who gave it to us? You need to ask yourself that. If you're going through it right now, or the very next time you're going through it, as soon as fear begins to creep up, ask yourself, where did this come from? Because my Bible says it didn't come from God. You see, the enemy wants to keep you afraid. He wants to keep you paralyzed, strangled, entangled, and vulnerable until you decide that maybe this Jesus thing isn't for you after all. But let me encourage you with the, ver- with the words of that verse. It says, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but he has given us power. He has given us love, and he has given us a sound mind. So the next time the devil tries to tell you you're crazy, tell him, yeah, I'm crazy for Jesus. And I will not fear again. I will not be afraid. You can stand on God's word. God's word declares in Psalm 27, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And Psalm 118.6 declares, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? In Romans chapter 8 verse 15 says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. I am no longer a slave to fear. Say it with me. I am no longer a slave to fear. Oh, no, I can be bold. I can be courageous because I don't walk alone. God's got my back. My Abba Father, my Daddy God walks with me, and he promised me peace. Now, you might say, well, Pastor, that all sounds good, but have you ever been troubled? Pastor, have you ever been afraid? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. See, the short answer is yes. The long answer is a sermon series all by itself. But have I ever been troubled? Have I ever been afraid? See, let me tell you that I know what it is to look down at your one-year-old child on a respirator. I know what troubled is. I know what it is to hear the doctor say that that child will be developmentally challenged and will never be on par with his peers. I know what trouble is. I know what it is to have the doctors put that child on medication that makes that child a, a, a shell of his former self. I know what trouble is. But I'm married to a godly woman. She's sitting over there, so I better say the right thing. (laughs) And my godly wife prayed, and she told me, she said, we are not giving our child this medication anymore. See, here's the funny thing. You guys see me on the platform, and and you will never see her on the platform unless she's, like, standing, like, right next to me. What you don't know is that she's the strong one. And she said, we're not giving this to our, med- to, to, to our child anymore. And I said, woman, if something happens to my son, that's on you. I know what trouble this. Incidentally, that's the one who graduated high school a year early and is about to graduate from Hofstra. <laughs> 
Now, my other two kids are going to be complaining this afternoon why, why I wasn't bragging about them. <laughs> so I'll hear that. So my next sermon, pay attention. My next sermon, there'll be something about, you know, the other kids. So I can tell you this, God is faithful. Jesus said that there are two heart conditions that threaten my peace. Being troubled and being afraid. So pastor, how do I stop being troubled? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. By the way, that's my thing. That's Pastor Tony's things. I'm glad you asked. Pastor Steve says, God has a plan for your life, and it's big. <laughs> Pastor Henry says, stop clapping. Look up at me for a second. <laughs> How do I stop being troubled? The great thing, the wonderful thing, the beautiful things that Jesus himself answered that question. John chapter 14, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. So when you're troubled, remind yourself that Jesus is preparing a place for you in eternity. Remind yourself that Jesus promised peace, but he also promised that he's coming back for you and for me so that he could take us to himself so that where he is forever, we may be also. So remind yourself that no, no matter how bad your current circumstances might be, and they might be bad, but remind yourself that they don't compare to what Jesus has in store for your forever. Paul encourages us in this way. He says, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So that means that the most amazing thing you've ever seen, not amazing enough. The most beautiful sound you've ever heard is not beautiful enough. The most wonderful thing that you've ever longed for is not wonderful enough to compare with what our God has already ordained for you and for me in glory. Nothing can compare. Beloved, that place that you're in right now, that place that I'm in right now, is just a stop in the journey. It's not the final destination. It's just a stop in the journey. It's not the final destination, so stop acting like it. So one, of the, one of my favorite things to do is get in the car and drive to Florida. I love driving to Florida. I do. But here's the thing about driving to Florida is that one tank of gas won't get me there. Now, some of you, listen, you're going to miss this. One tank of gas won't get me there. See, God has a plan for your life, and it is big. God has a destiny for you, a purpose for you. But the tank that you got right now won't get you there. You're going to need to make some stops along the way. And yes, some of those stops are less favorable than others. And God has ordained it as such so that he could fill your tank at every stop so that you can keep going. The problem is when we get out the car... There's no gas. And we're right at the pump. But we go, wow, look at this miserable place. This isn't Florida. Where's Mickey Mouse? Oh, that's, ah, I'm done. (laughs) 
get your gas and move on. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. Believe and see your trouble in the context of God's plan. And you'll come to know that God is faithful to his promise of peace. So next time the enemy comes to shake up your life, believe that God is preparing an eternity for you. And you will find yourself to be like a martini in the hands of James Bond. You are shaken but not stirred. <laughs> we don't have to be troubled. We don't have to. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Okay, pastor. Then how do I stop being afraid? Well, that's a great question. Come on, say it with me. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> now, I want to teach you something for the next few minutes. And we're going to be wrapping up soon, within the next 45 minutes at least. Here's another service, you know. I want to teach you something. Some of you may have heard this. If you sat in my class, you've heard this at one point or another. But it's important to note that we are biological beings and that our bodies respond to external stimuli. That is a natural process which has nothing to do with faith. It's a natural process that has nothing to do with faith. If I put my hand over a flame, I will get burned because that is the natural order that God prepared, that God created. And God doesn't usually override his natural order. When he does, it's called a miracle. But God has established a natural order. And as part of that natural order, our bodies produce adrenaline in response to situations to prepare us for fight or flight. Now listen to me closely. You will likely not be able to stop or control your biological reaction, your biological response. But you can certainly do something about your physical and emotional response. There is a method. There is something that you can do. It is tried and true. It is a proven process that has been utilized and mastered by God's people throughout the ages. King David wrote about it in Psalm 34. I know that you're sitting at the edge of your seat. You want to know what is the method. Well, Psalm 34, 4 declares, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. The answer, beloved, is prayer. It's the weapon that God gives us in this realm of spiritual warfare. We pray. And when we feel that sudden pressure, that wave, that tsunami of fear coming over us, we need to pray. We need to push. We need to pray until something happens. We need to pray, pray, pray. And ask the worship team to start making their way back. You know, I remember uh, several years ago, the Lord put it in my heart to go into full-time ministry. I had been a bivocational minister for a long time, for like 20 years. And I was a volunteer pastor here at Bethlehem. But I felt the Lord impress upon me that he was calling me to do more. He's calling me to do more. So... I transitioned into full-time ministry here at Bethlehem. And at that time, I was serving as the outreach missions and Spanish pastor. And I remember one night, as I was on my knees praying, suddenly I felt overwhelmed with fear. You heard me correctly. As I was on my knees praying... I suddenly felt overwhelmed with fear. And it was like I could hear the voice of the devil. It sounded a whole lot like Pastor Tony in panic. 
I could hear the voice of the devil asking me, what did you do? What did you do? You gave up all your licenses that it took you so many years to accumulate. You gave up a vice presidency at a Fortune 500 company. You gave up your salary. What if this doesn't work? What did you do? Now, I could tell you that I quickly rebuked the thought and moved on, but I'd be lying. It's the truth is that I had to stay on my knees and pray through the tears and pray and pray and pray. And I prayed until I felt the fear dissipate. I prayed until I felt a renewed sense of God's promise of peace. Please don't misunderstand me. The moral of the story is not how strong I am, but how strong God is in the midst of my weakness. If I am willing to come to the Lord in prayer when I'm surrounded by fear, and if I'm willing to be vulnerable and honest with God about my heart's condition. That's why Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the promise of peace which God gives. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's a peace that confuses the world. It's peace when you lose a loved one. It's peace when you lose your job. It's peace when your house is in foreclosure and peace when you're facing a breakup. It's peace when you're waiting for your kids to turn their lives around. And it's peace when you're waiting on God for your breakthrough. It's the peace that you receive in the hallway while you're waiting for the door to open up. It's a promise of peace. It surpasses all understanding. It's not logical to the world. The world will say to you, you should be falling apart. You'll never bounce back from this. The world will say your life is over. And the Lord will ask you, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? How can you have peace in the midst of this trial? How can you have peace in this moment? And you and I, we can reply every time. I have peace that you don't understand because I serve a God that you don't know. He's promised me peace. He's promised me his peace. And it will guard our hearts and guard our minds. So beloved, let not your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. For God has given you an unchanging promise, the promise of peace. You bow your heads with me this morning. Lord, we thank you for your unchanging promise of peace. We thank you for your word, which reminds us that you already paid the price so that we might have peace. Holy Spirit, sweet Holy Spirit, Pray that you would touch hearts in this place today, helping those of us who are struggling, those who are troubled, and those who are afraid. That they might feel your embrace today and receive the peace that surpasses all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, today we spoke regarding the promise of peace the peace of God. But the truth is that you can't really experience the peace of of God 
until you've experienced peace with God. Because as long as you have any uncertainty about where you'll spend eternity, you will not have peace. But the good news, and it is literally the good news, is that peace with God is available to you today. And that peace comes through a relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, who died to give us peace. Now, if that's you, if you're here today, if you've been living without peace, you don't know where you would spend eternity if you were to die today. Well, at the end of the service, there's going to be some altar counselors right here. And they're going to be here to help you take the first steps of your journey to peace. Now, I'd like to ask everyone to stand as the worship team leads us in another song. Please take a moment to contemplate the promise of peace and offer God your gratitude through worship. I won't pray for you today to receive peace because Jesus already promised it to you. But as we worship together, feel free to come towards the altar to press in, to give your troubles and your fears to the Lord and to receive in exchange the promise of peace.